Next up, we welcome our keynote address by Elaine Westbrooks. Ms. Bress, Ms. Excuse me. Ms. Westbrooks is the Vice Provost for University Libraries and University Librarian at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and is a board member of the Digital Public Library of America. Her keynote address is titled, Representing the Others, Preserving Evidence and Knowledge for Equity. Ms. Westbrook, the digital floor is yours. All right, great, thank you. Let's see if I can get my screen shared. Okay. Oops. Okay. All right. Okay, so thank you so much. Um, it is an honor to be here and I'd like to thank um, Danielle, the board of directors. I'd also like to thank the conference committee and Glenda, who's been really amazing. Um, when I initially got this invitation to do the keynote, of course, this was months ago and I never dreamed I'd be doing it in the midst of a global pandemic. And so I especially want to thank all of you attendees. Um, it looks like we have 400 people who are attending this conference. That's amazing. Um, but in the middle of this craziness of COVID-19, I think it's very impressive that you took time out of your schedule to be here today. And, um, and, the, and I can only say that um, what's gonna be happening in, in these next couple months, like nobody knows what's gonna happen, but I feel really good about um, the work that I do as a librarian and an administrator and the work that we all do as a community is extremely important. So um, hang in there. Uh, I think we're all gonna get through this together, um, but this is, this is just an amazing opportunity. I've never done a presentation or a keynote using Zoom. So um, yeah, so we'll just jump right in and see how everything goes. So um, what I could basically start off by focusing on is that diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility are these values that a lot of universities, a lot of cultural heritage institutions certainly value and are promoting um, as important parts of our organization. And I think that these are clearly important and this having this diversity and having the representation of groups is really important. And that's something that, that is very personal to me. And so I think a lot about representation and what it's like to be an African-American woman leading a library system at a predominantly white institution. I think about the representation of librarians and archivists and how many uh, librarians and archivists uh, or are of color and, um, and then thinking about diversity in a broad way. So of course, it's not just ethnic diversity, but thinking about gender, um, able, ableness, thinking about um, all of these different things that make us different, which makes our organizations much more rich because we have a diverse set of people um, across the range of sexual orientation, ethnicity, race, gender, and those things. Um, but I think that this diversification and, and, the, and the value of diversity is important. However, it's not enough. And I am going to talk about my experience at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and talk about how representation is great. But if you don't start to look at yourself and think about how your organization is designed and the systems that exist in your organization, which are designed for inequity, then you could do as much representation as you want and it's never gonna get you anywhere. So I'll use some examples from my organization and then I'll close by talking about what reckoning means and how we can all begin this reckoning process so that we can um, create a more equitable world. Okay, so, I'm pretty sure that all of you are familiar with this photograph. Um, this is a photograph from the Unite the Right rally 
um, which was a white supremacist and neo-Nazi rally that was conducted in Charlottesville, Virginia, April 11th to 12th, 2017. And why this is such a pivotal moment for myself as well as the entire country is this is the moment in which I moved to North Carolina. Um, literally, I'm un unpacking my boxes and this is unfolding. And so, of course, like many of you, I was horrified by these events. And of course, Charlottesville is only a couple hours away from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um, but this rally was basically um, the result of the removal of a Confederate monument by the local Charlottesville government. And um, that uh, Confederate uh, monument, which was of uh, Robert E. Lee, um, was removed as a result of the response to the uh, Charleston um, church shooting in 2015, in which self-proclaimed white supremacists shot and killed nine black members of that congregation. So this Unite the, the Right rally um, is a very pivotal, pivotal experience for the United States to understand who are we, what are we as Americans, and how do we respond to this? I mean, one thing I have to also mention is that during this rally, um, a self-identified white supremacist um, deliberately rammed his car into a crowd of counter protesters about half a mile from the rally and killed Heather Heyer and injured 19 other people. So lives, there was a life lost during this process. Um, and how we respond to an event like this really defines who we are. And so who are we and who am I? And we as Americans, how do we respond to this white supremacy? How do we respond um, to this event? How do we learn from it? What's, how does it impact us now? How, does it, how did it impact us in 2017? And, um, and how will scholars be talking about the Unite the, Ra the Right rally 50 years from now? So, you know, I've thought about this quite a bit. You know, I moved in North Carolina the first message I sent to my staff was about Charlottesville. And so I think I was on the job for about a week. <laughs> and, and that was just one of those pivotal moments where, wow, this is the first thing I'm communicating. And it is about this Charlottesville Unite the Right rally. And what does it mean for the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill? Okay, so just to give you some background, I'm gonna talk about the University of North Carolina. It's the first public university founded in 1789. And this image is of the first, um, one of the first items acquired for the university library. And what's really interesting is that the University of North Carolina considers itself the most public of public universities and is very um, proud of being the first public university. Um, but this book was um, recorded as part of the university's collections in 1869. Um, but the University of North Carolina actually was able to stay open during the Civil War, but it closed during Reconstruction for a variety of reasons. But this book is called The Works of the Right Reverend Father. And this is just such a pivotal book in the history of the university. And, um, and I when I talk about my university and my library, I typically start with this picture, this image, because it really defines um, the university in a very important way as also the birthplace of um, the public university in America. So of the public and for the public, um, we have to go back and look at the history of University of North Carolina. So I talked about 1789 as the beginning um, but the legacy of white supremacy at the University of North Carolina is real. And so what we see here is an image of a Confederate monument known as Silent Sam. And um, this is a Confederate so soldier that was crafted by a sculpture, a Canadian sculpture. And um, this monument stood at the opening door or gate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, it was put in place in 1913. And um, it was the result or the goal of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. So in 1907, the, the United Daughters of the Confederacy decided that they wanted to put this monument up. And so they hired a um, sculptor and this um, 
Soldier is basically based on a young Boston man who he used as his model. And so in June of 1913, um, this monument was put in place, a local industrious um, and UNC trustee, Julian Carr gave a speech espousing white supremacy while Governor Locke Craig and University of North Carolina, President Francis Venable and members of the United Daughters of the Confederacy praised the sacrifices made by students who volunteer to fight for the Confederacy. Um, interestingly enough, Julian Carr was not only a trustee at the University of North Carolina, he was also a trustee at Duke University. But Carr went on to say, um, the present generation, I am persuaded, scarcely takes note of what the Confederate soldier meant to the welfare of the Anglo-Saxon race during the four years immediately succeeding the war, when the facts are that their courage and steadfastness saved the very life of the Anglo-Saxon race in the South. He goes on to say that 100 yards from where we stand, less than 90 days perhaps after my return from Appomattox, I horsewhipped the Negro wench until her skirt hung in shreds because upon the streets of this quiet village, she had publicly insulted and maligned a Southern lady and then rushed for protection to these university buildings where, where we stationed a garrison of 100 federal soldiers. So when you think about the speech that was delivered when this monument was installed in 1913, it's very clear what it meant. And there are many people who would say, this is not about hate, this is heritage, but it's very clear that this monument was always about white supremacy. And one thing I could note is that um, there are Confederate monuments um, all over the United States. They're not just in the South. In fact, 75% of the states in the United States have some form of Confederate monument. And the North is not protected from this. There are many monuments in New York um, Pennsylvania, West Virginia. And even if you might not have a Confederate monument, you certainly have monuments to eugenicists, you have monuments to anti-Semites. Um, there there's a lot of hate that was built into these landscapes. We, a lot of groups wanted to pepper the landscapes with these types of images to preserve the lost cause of the Civil War, but to also um, disenfranchise groups, right? So. This is just something to, that I think is really critical when we think about the history of the South. So shockingly enough, the UNC Board of Governors, which is the group that oversees all of the universities in, in the um, North Carolina, all the public universities, um, in November of last year, wanted to get rid of this monument because it was such a problem on the campus. Um, they gave two and a half million dollars to a Confederate group to preserve it. So it is when this happened that I decided that it was critical for the library to do something. And so the things that we were doing were wonderful in terms of how we engage our community, but setting up statements and, and writing letters is not enough. And so I felt like this is the moment where I decided that the university libraries is going to reckon with itself and set up a reckoning initiative to really um, do something about um, our history of our legacy of slavery and the history of white supremacy at the university. So luckily, um, this deal has been reversed. And, um, and so if I could go back, so the monument went up in um, 1913, it was actually toppled and um, 2018 and between August of 2018 and um, December of 2019, it was it, that monument was basically stored off campus. And so during that time, that basically about a year, the people were trying to figure out what to do with this monument. And so the monument has not been returned to its, its space on campus. And there's still a lot of discussions of what to do with this monument. Okay, so now I just want to give you some examples that I think are not unique to the University of North Carolina, um, but are things that special collections tend to do. And so the University of North Carolina is known for its special collections. We have about 60 full-time staff that are devoted to special collections. 
And it's a pretty extensive collection of, you know, millions, like about 30 million manuscripts and rare books, artifacts, photographs, um, audiovisual recording, and of course, born digital records. Um, this is a slide, I think, from the 1968 National Championship. Uh, we also, of course, preserve the history of the university. And um, this is from a, a major exhibit we did on um, I Raise My Hand, and we really focused on the sit-in movement, which of course, you know, in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is right down the street from us, um, that was a pivotal moment in the history of civil rights, uh, but also thinking about what's happening on campus. Another exhibition that we just launched, or actually we did this last year, was on migration and, um, and looking at um, African-American migration and the, the migration after um, basically World War I of millions of African Americans to the north. So this is something that um, I've wanted to instill in our organization, which is I want exhibitions that represent me and my history and not the history of, of um, white Americans, which has what been the dominant narrative coming from the university as well as many universities. Um, another thing that we do that I'm sure many of you do is we also focus on social media. And so this is a capture from Twitter. And so we really focused on what was being said in social media um, about Silent Sam, what was being said about um, what was happening after the election. And so there were lots of things going on in social media. Um, another thing that we focus on is how do we attract undergraduate students into our special collections? And so um, a couple years ago, we actually had a library employee who was also a recreational therapist. And, um, and she noticed that a lot of undergraduate students were just very intimidated by our special collections library. And so um, in 2012, we set up an immersive live action game called Clue. And we have been doing this several times a year um, ever since. And this has been tremendously um, impactful for us. And this is a way of bringing our undergraduate students where they form teams, and um, it's extremely popular. And, and typically we release, uh, we, we select the date where we're going to start the game and it typically is sold out within about two hours. So it's a very popular game that we use to um, lower the barriers. Um, we also do student curated exhibitions and this exhibition is on reconstructing Frankenstein's monster um, which was a class, um, an English class, an honors English class. And so we had some students do an exhibition. Um, and of course they were guided by librarians and, and specialists in the, um, our special collections library. And they spent the entire semester in the archives working on this um, exhibition. Another example, and this is something that really aligns with the work that's happening with the Digital Commonwealth and DPLA, which is our North Carolina Digital Heritage Center, um, which is our statewide digitization and digital publishing program that we host. Um, it works with the cultural heritage institutions across North Carolina to digitize and publish historical materials online. And so we work with historical societies, high schools, churches, any organization in the state of North Carolina who has materials that they want to preserve. Okay, another thing we work on is audiovisual heritage. And our biggest collection in our, in our special collections is our audiovisual collection, or the fastest growing collection, I should say. And we are really trying to uh, focus on how we can digitize, preserve, the sh and share the unique audio moving image um, history of the state of North Carolina. And so fortunately, we've gotten some Mellon funding to, to fund this grant, but it really is um, important for us to focus on the uh, media, which is, of course, as many of you know, um, it's becoming um, obsolete. The media, the, it's deteriorating. It is definitely at risk. And so we really want to up our, our work in um, preserving North Carolina's audiovisual heritage, but also think about the rest of the South. And we have partners across the, uh, across the state with this in terms of the Forest Historical Society in Durham, the Southern Appalachia Archives, um, and, a f and another um, several institutions in the um, state of North Carolina. 
Um, the other thing that we do is we invite um, speakers. And as I mentioned before, and I think about representation, I want us to bring speakers who look like me, speakers um, who are doing amazing research. And so just in February, we had um, the speaker, uh, Raina Hogarth, who's a faculty member at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And she helped us kick off our recent exhibition on, um, on deconstructing difference. And, um, and so this exhibition that we crafted looks at how race has been defined by scientists as well as popular culture over the centuries and how those definitions affected how people live their lives. So this was very well attended. And, um, and this is just another example of things that we've been doing. And again, one thing I should have said at the very beginning is, you know, I'm speaking a lot about special collections, but my background is in technical services and I am not an archivist, but I am speaking about my understanding of this work from the lens of a librarian, so as well as an administrator. Um, and I think it's important that we think about representation as librarians and archivists because the materials that we're digitizing, the materials that we're making accessible through our, through our consortia and through DPLA are really critical and it often starts with the archives that we have. Okay. So you can characterize all these examples I've laid out um, as the work of any special collections unit or a special collections library like we have but um, these examples that I've laid out um, aren't enough, right? And I know that many of your organizations like mine, when we try to, to step out of our system and our mold and we try to do these innovative things, it's often funded by grants and that's not very sustainable. But I also would say that um, through the process of being at North Carolina um, for two and a half years, and really pushing this idea that we need to be representing all kinds of um, histories. Um, it's really made me think about one of the most important challenges that we have is that the historical record that we focused on for hundreds of years is, com is not complete. And essentially the archive that we have is, is a Jim Crow archive. It is really not the history of um, the bulk of the people who were enslaved at, in North Carolina. It's not the history of people who look like me. And so we have a, a, a responsibility to make the record a little more complete. And it's, it's an uphill battle, but this is something that we're definitely committed to. And so I wanted to use this quote from Randall um, Jimerson, which I, I believe he's at Western Washington. But this is just something back from 2007 and I've been looking at, well, how have archivists been talking about social justice and how have archivists been, been um, thinking about um, their roles um, in our society and their roles in our organizations. And so I'll just pause and let you read that quote. And so then I wanted to fast forward to 2015 and see how these ideas that we hear from the archives community primarily have been evolving. And so we fast forward from Randall Jimerson to in 27 to 2007, I'm sorry, to Mario Ramirez in 2015. And then let's go to more present times, uh, Michelle Caswell who I think many of you are familiar with, um, who was on the faculty at UCLA, who really, I think, um, her thinking about dismantling white supremacy in the archives, her work has been pivotal in thinking about how do we disrupt this system. Okay, so when we think about preservation, conservation, archiving, description, we have to, understand that there are multiple ways of doing this. And I think for many years, for decades and decades, the model was if you wanted to preserve something, you had to go get it from somewhere and bring it to your institution and, and you take custody and control of that archive. That's been a model, whether it's an indigenous population, whether it is 
a church, the idea was that you took full custody of the materials. And I, and I think we all know that there has to be a continuum of, of methods for doing this type of work. And so I'm really proud of the work that we've been doing on community-driven archives. And community-driven archives are about advocacy, they're about education, they're about engagement and empowerment. Um, but the key thing that I wanna mention is that how do we promote equal ownership of archives and share stewardship responsibilities? And so it's not that the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill has to possess the archives, but that we have an obligation to go out in the communities and the community drives our interactions and engagements. And, and in that way, we can think about underrepresented history keepers and how they can tell their story, share their, share their stories and preserve their stories. And so with this community driven archives, we have an African American family documentation initiative um, to help people tell their stories. And so we really focus on, um, on engaging the community through exhibitions and programs. We talk about defining the role of the family historian and shared resources. And then we wanna inspire families on how these materials can be used by scholars, artists and writers and et cetera. One of the big parts of this program on community driven archives is our archives in a backpack. Um, and the question we wanted to answer is what if a community could build its own archive, tell its own story in a way that would help scholars understand its true history as lived by community members. And so this backpack was set up um, as a resource for com community partners. Um, and so these mobile kits, kits would help to jumpstart community history projects by providing technology, tools, and resources commonly used in archives and oral history work. Um, and so we've given out, I think, at least 100 of these backpacks. And, um, and I think this is just a, another great example of something that's not super complicated, but ways to get tools in people's hands so that communities are empowered and that the, the only goal is not to take the stuff and bring it back to Chapel Hill, but we can work with historically black towns, we can work um, across the state and think about what can the University of North Carolina do to empower communities. Um, one thing I'm really proud, about, proud of is um, our conscious editing initiative. And um, this is a project that, or actually an initiative that started in our technical services department. And our goal is to explore past use of marginalized language and descriptive practice focused primarily on archival description. Um, but the main thing is that we're um, not only looking at the Library of Congress subject headings, but we wanted to set up guidelines and best practices for reparative description of legacy collections. And so as a historian, if you were doing um, research on slavery, it's virtually impossible to find out how many um, kidnapped and enslaved people are on a certain plantation. And so we have thousands and thousands of records about the plantations, but we don't have information about the enslaved people who are on those plantations. And so the, their history, their agency, it's a complete erasure of their um, being. And so this conscious editing initiative is um, something that we've been working on for many years. And we do hope that um, through these descriptive practices, we know they have an impact on curation, they have an impact on reference, they have an in impact on teaching. And so this focus is primarily on legacy description, but it really forces us to look at, well, what are we doing now? And how can we make changes now into the future so that we don't have to um, basically commit to um, erasing the history of, of the enslaved and, and kidnapped people and decenter the archive on, because the archive is centered on whiteness. And so we're trying to decenter that. And that's going to take a lot of time. We're thinking about how we can use artificial intelligence and machine learning to do this in a much more robust way, because it's going to take us decades um, to move forward. Okay, so another thing I wanted to mention, I talked a lot about archives. But this is something I've been thinking about and working on quite a bit, and that is thinking about knowledge creation and scholarship. And so many of us have, um, we're from libraries and museums, 
And we think about our research collections and how deep and accessible we can make them. Um, but we are working in an inequitable space and, and it's often um, manifested in negotiations with companies like Elsevier and things like that. But um, I just wanted to acknowledge this idea that, you know, for years and for, for basically almost three decades, we've been talking about the cereals crisis and the cost of research and how um, problematic it is that the publishing uh, or the commercial publishing area is dominated by multinational companies and they are price gouging and they're making it impossible for universities to, to be able to afford research. And so I have to call on the University of California who made this incredible move and um, I think it was on February 28th last year and they decided to drop Elsevier. And it was a $50 million deal for the entire UC system. And that was a big wake up call for lots of people to think about, wow, they actually walked away. And I know it was a definitely a wake up call for me and my institution. Um, but I'd like to quote um, Leslie Chan because he has really done some amazing work. He's at the um, University of Toronto and he's not in the library system, but um, he's a faculty member there who really focuses on equity. And so I'll just pause here while you read this quote. And so I think what's really interesting in thinking about open access, because when we talk about the problems of, of these huge big deals that are being sold to us from the Elsevier's and the Springer's and Taylor and Francis, we often think about open access as, a, as an answer or a solution to this major problem. But it, we have to think about open access and ways of equity. And I think he really does a good job of, of talking about um, power and inequality in terms of the scholarship and research that's being created. Um, here's another quote from Leslie. And I'll pause here to give you a chance to read it. And so what he's speaking to here is that you have the global South, which is um, larger when you think about Latin America, Africa, um, that these are parts of the world that just do not have access to research. Um, and it's increasingly harder for them to create research. And so he's speaking about um, the challenge that we have that the global North is really dominating it, even though the bulk of research is coming from um, China at this point. Um, but I think what's most important is that the, the central goal of open access should be about making research more equitable and democratic. And part of the problem is, is that there's systemic injustice and in the protection and circulation of knowledge. So when we think about scholarly publishing, it's just full of inequity. Who gets to create knowledge? When do they get to create it? If you're at an elite institution, you have a lot of opportunities to create knowledge. The peer review system is extremely flawed. And who gets to decide what articles are important? Who, um, who are the people who are in charge of the editorial process? Who determines um, who gets published? And, and I think, and, and when we think about these journals and we have these top tier journals, and so I have number five, the research metrics, um, like impact factors are tremendously problematic. Um, they give the illusion of objectivity and authority, but it's completely um, an unfair tool and it can be gained. And so when we think about the metrics are wrong, the pay to play is something that we're seeing a lot and that we have what we call these transformative agreements where an organization is really paying to publish as opposed to paying to read the articles. And so that definitely is an example of when the global South is disadvantaged by um, thinking about um, how they can actually produce knowledge. Okay, I'm gonna move quickly. And so what we have here is an oligopoly where we have basically about five companies that are controlling the bulk of, of um, publishing today. And this cycle of scholarly publishing, if you start from the top right, you'll see how the researchers are working, the funders and university pay, 
then the authors do the work. The authors do the peer review, the university pays. You don't see the publisher really paying until the publication part. And then at the end of the process with discovery and dissemination, the libraries do the work to make the information accessible and the university pays. This is what we call a racket. And this is not a sustainable process that needs to change. And here are the, the values that we use when we think about what kind of system do we want? We want one that's affordable, sustainable, transparent, and open. Um, and so now, as I run out of time, um, let me make sure. Okay, so as we think about equity, um, I want to want us to think about equity as a strategy for fairness, and. Um, and we should be thinking about equity as providing um, what anyone needs to be successful. It's not about treating everyone the same. It's about providing people with the things that they need to be successful. And so when we think about approaching ex, um, equity, we have to think about inclusive excellence. And this is a, actually taken from our strategic plan where we are thinking about how do we focus on inclusive excellence um, and accepting the fact that diversity is something we already have. Um, but the next step is to think about how do we make the, the library a place for belonging? And how do we approach collections with inclusive excellence? How do we approach our physical spaces? How do we approach our, our budget? And so, as I mentioned before, when the university, um, or I'm sorry, the, the Board of Governors of the University of North Carolina system had um, decided to give $2.5 million to a white supremacist group, I really thought about this reckoning and what that means for us. And so one of the examples I wanted to give is, um, and many of you probably heard about this, but the Baltimore Museum of Art um, um, basically unveiled their plan to only buy art by women um, in, the, up in the next year. And so at the time when they made this announcement, only 4% of the museum's collections were by female artists. And so as part of the Baltimore Museum's um, 2020 vision initiative, the museum will also showcase at least 20 exhibitions featuring the work from diverse range of women. And so you have this director, Christopher Bedford, who was really focused on, if we're going to change the system, you can't just say, okay, we're gonna just try to buy a few more women's art. They decided that they would solely focus on purchasing that art to change their system. And so we talked about building a permanent collection is building a story for all time. And the challenge is a lot of our permanent collections are centered on whiteness. And so this is an interesting quote. So when Christopher Bedford went out and talked about this, he, um, he got a lot of pushback from a community. And this is one of those cases where people are like, wait a minute, okay, so we have this white guy who's really talking about something that a lot of women have been talking about for a really long time. But is this just a stunt? Like, is this really what's gonna happen? And we'll see if he's actually successful. And so if I think about reckoning, what does that mean? Um, and that's really accounting for what you've done. And it, and it um, is really about thinking, um, what can you do to repair the harm that you've caused to communities. And so what we're doing at the University of North Carolina, or what we're about to do, I mean, this is something that's really in the phase of, of, of my head and working with my leadership team, but as we have to examine each system that we have and dismantle it. And so the assumption is that our systems are full of inequity, human resources. And so thinking about how we hire, onboard, performance management, training, retention. When we think about budget, um, how's the money allocated? Who gets to decide who gets what? Um, our virtual and physical spaces, how are they accessible? When we think about development of fundraising, who are our donors? And is that a diverse set of people? Um, what can we do to um, think about fundraising and development in different ways? The way we communicate, our IT is a big challenge in thinking about not just the diversity um, of our IT units, but thinking about the vendors we use, and what languages you use and how we um, engage our communities. And then of course, I've been talking a lot about reckoning and how collection work in terms of our conscious editing and community driven archives. So just looking at some examples of um, education and training, 
Um, this is a chart um, that just represents the SEALS, which is the North Carolina, um, University of North Carolina School of Information and Library Science. And so in fall of 2019, this is the makeup of the student body of the master's program. And so if you see the numbers, um, it is a majority white um, student body. And that's something that is going to have to change. We need to be able to attract different kinds of groups into the librarian profession. Um, and this is just one example of, of the numbers that I've looked at. And so I can't control what's happening in the School of Library and Information Science, but I can certainly put pressure on the dean and say that things have to change. Um, and so I've talked a lot about collections, but it's always about representation. Who are we representing? Who are we representing? The majority are we representing the other but thinking about how are we acquiring things how do we describe arrange the preservation all of these things um, have to have context and are steeped in the history of the institution and the organization and so at the university of north carolina we're really thinking about all of these different things and and one thing that i think is the most important thing that i want to mention is that it's great to have exhibitions that are focusing on african African-American communities or focused on the LGBTQ community or thinking about indigenous populations or thinking about what disability means in this country. But if you are not looking at yourself and your internal organization and dismantling the systems that create inequity, it's, you're not gonna be effective. And so I'm not saying stop doing those great exhibitions, stop hiring um, or tr stop trying to diversify your organization. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that Reckoning is one thing that must be done, and there's no shortcut to this work. Um, and I hope in the next six months, I'll get a lot further with our Reckoning initiative and, and promoting it and really thinking about how can I, as a leader of an organization, really look at ourselves and interrogate what we do and use that information and the data that we gather to make a significant change in the kind of organization we are going to be. So thank you. And I think it's time for questions. I'm going to unshare my screen, I think. And all right. Thank you, Elaine. Um, I'm going to remain, this is Sonia, I'm going to remain the anonymous voice just so our audience can still see you on the screen. Uh, we have about eight minutes for questions and we have five questions. So I'll be reading them to you and if you could please answer them, that would be fantastic. The first question is, topics about racism and white supremacy are hot button issues. Does the university top level administration support the library in addressing these topics even when they become or have the potential to become controversial and attract widespread attention? That's a great question. And um, I would say the answer is like a yes, no. And so when I started thinking about this um, reckoning, I did go to my supervisors and provost and I said, look, this is something I wanna do. And he said, this is great. Um, I think the challenge is that I don't know if he fully understands the extent of what I want to do and how radical it can be. And so I think it's one of those things where <coughs> I want to do the right thing and I'm going to move forward on this. Um, and I know it's going to attract a lot of attention and not good intention. And I know that um, it's a risk, but I think it's an important risk. And I didn't come to the University of North Carolina to maintain the status quo. I came to transform that organization and to redefine what it means to be a research library in a digital age. And if we don't reckon with our, our past, our racist practices, and our practices that were centered on patriarchy and misogyny and ableness and all these other, um, uh, I, have, I don't feel like I have a choice. And so, and even when I look at the, the library system that I lead, there will not be 100% support of this either. And so this is a risk, but it's important that we do it the right way. I'm not trying to alienate people. I'm not trying to shame people, but we have to change who we are and how we do our business 
if we're going to make a difference on this campus. And I believe the library could lead that for the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Thank you. Um, next question. I would love to know if there is a shareable vocabulary thesaurus coming from the Carolina Conscious Editing Initiative that could be used at other institutions. Um, yes, uh, I will figure out a way to post that information. And we have a Conscious Editing Initiative Steering Committee. And I think I need to do a shout out to Laura Hart and Sonoy Akasoni who are chairing, co-chairing that group. Um, but yeah, you have to be clear on what you mean by um, editing, what you mean by white supremacy and, and agency and all these other things. You have to be clear on those terms. And so I'm not sure if we have a thesaurus or a lexicon, but I could certainly um, dig in and share that um, through Glenda and we'll figure out a way to get that information out to all of you. Thank you. Do you include, um, third question, I'm sorry. Do you include student workers in these efforts? If so, how do you include them and support their thoughtful participation? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I've been so focused on the full-time staff. I have not given as much thought to the student employees. However, what I can say is we have a program with the School of Information and Library Science um, we call it the Kahlo program in which students work in the library for two years um, while they're earning their degree. And it's a very prestigious um, fellowship. And we've essentially switched that fellowship to one on um, essentially social justice issues. And so people come and they think about um, these issues and whatever work that they're doing, whether it's archives or if they're interested in assessment or if they're interested in preservation or IT everyone's coming in with a social justice bent. And so that's been I think, very successful, but I'm glad you gave me that idea that I need to be thinking more about the students, not just students who are studying library science, but we have, we, we have about 275 students and that includes graduate students who are working in the library system. So they're an important population that I think should be targeted. Thank you. There have been, uh, next question, there have been instances where library directors have been dismissed for certain controversial exhibits. How do you approach contextualizing your exhibits to avoid such issues? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, it's a risk. And even with the, the exhibit we did on um, race um, and the history of race, you know, I just don't think we should shy away from controversial topics. And so I've been okay so far. And I think the whole contextualization is really important. And it's very easy for even a white supremacy group to take the exhibitions that we have and we eventually get it online and to use that as, as fodder for, the, for their spread of hate. Um, but I think it's, it's who I am. And I think it's a risk worth taking that you tell the truth. Like, John Hope Franklin said, you tell the unvarnished truth. And it's time that the truths of, of people of color, of, of indigenous people, those truths need to be told. And if I can't do that, um, then, you know, I don't know why I'm here and why I'm in this profession, because that's what's most important to me as part of my identity, but also thinking about transforming an organization. Thank you. Um, oh, um, next question. Um, if there's a comment followed by a question. As a person of color myself, I find that in my personal life, bringing up topics of diversity, of diversity inclusion receives a lot of pushback. With initiatives such as you describe being derided as, quote, affirmative action, end quote, and a gimmick social justice warrior, etc. While I'd love to believe these are just a few intolerant people, these are people who in many cases are educated, professional students, et cetera. My question is, how do you reach out to a majority white user base to show how these things are not only useful, but necessary? Um, that's an excellent point. It's really difficult work. And um, I think, what's or i guess my strategy has been that there are a lot of champions in my library 
And so a conscious editing product, project or initiative started before I even got to the University of North Carolina. And so we already had people who were thinking about these issues in a, in a very um, meaningful way. And so I lean on those champions. And so I have a, a committee called like the Diversity, Inclusion, Social Justice, and Accessibility Committee. And they're a very committed group of librarians and archivists who are thinking about these issues. And so I really start with those champions. I do know that there will be haters in, in the organization. And, and I think what I really focus on is um, the numbers. And so one thing we've done is this, there's an organization um, who focuses on racial equity here in North Carolina, and we've made it possible for as many people as possible to attend the racial equity. And so my entire leadership team has participated in, in racial equity training. And so that training is really grounded in numbers. And if you look at the data, you cannot deny that there are negative consequences of our healthcare system, of our criminal justice system, of our educational system. It shows you the ways in which African-American people have been impacted and traumatized by these systems. So that is one way. And of course, people look at the data and they still don't want to believe it because they don't want to believe that they've been fed a lot of lies their entire life and that the history books have not been accurate and in capturing the African-American experience and capturing what the Civil War was really about. So, so I focus on the champions. I try to do a data-driven approach. And then it's one of those things where for my management team, they know that if they're gonna be on my management team, they're gonna have to be um, steeped in these issues and understand these issues. And so it's a requirement to be a leader at my institution to be on board. Um, now, when it comes down to the middle managers, um, we don't have as much consistency there. And, and as I mentioned, an entire organization, everyone's not on board, but that's okay. And I'm not going to get everyone on board, but I, I try to reach people as much as possible. And I firmly believe that an organization that has more diversity is a better organization. It makes better decisions and it's more innovative when you include all kinds of voices and decisions and, um, and problem solving. Thank you. What a fantastic end to that question and, the, and answer period. Thank you very much, Elaine. We will now move on to our next presentation. Great, thank you.